listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, you're listening to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio with me, Deborah Wolf, as usual. I'm calling in from Camp Good Dog, where we have many, many happy campers, all spoiled dogs, in that they get everything they need the food, the care, the vet care, the loving home, all the things they want where they live. And sometimes it makes me think about all the dogs out there that are just as deserving. Some of the dogs that are just as deserving are sitting in shelters and sitting in foster homes and sitting in rescue places, even though there is someone that wants them. There's someone somewhere else in a different town that is saying, that's my dog. I want that dog. I'll rescue that dog. And we just can't get the dog to the family. So today I thought I'd do something about that. I've heard about this organization before, and I know my animal party Pet Life Radio listeners will appreciate this. It's a pretty cool thing. I'm going to tell you today about pilots who volunteer to fly dogs, cats too, to their forever homes. So with me today as my guest is Kate Quinn coming to us from Pilots and Paws. Welcome to the show, Kate. Thanks so much, Deb. It's a pleasure to be here. How in the world did you think of this? Who came up with this and how? Yeah, so Pilots and Paws kind of happened by chance, actually. You know, necessity is the greatest driver of invention. And we have two co-founders. One was a woman named Debbie Boyce, and she had been involved in animal rescue for decades. As you mentioned, there is often a supply and demand issue with animal rescue where you know, there's homes for animals further away, but then there's maybe a shelter that where there aren't any local homes to be had. So Debbie was actually adopting a Doberman named Brock, who was in Florida. He had been badly abused by dog fights. He was used as a bait dog. So it was very, very important to her that she would bring him to her home in South Carolina and really give him a new chance at, you know, a happy and healthy life. So Debbie put out the word. She sent out emails and phone calls to her family and friends, just checking to see if anyone would be making the the trip from Florida up to South Carolina. And one of her friends just happened to be a pilot, pilot John Warenberg, and he offered to fly Debbie's husband down to Florida with him to get Brock and bring him back to South Carolina. So after the flight, everything went beautifully. It was a huge success. You know, Brock was now safely in South Carolina and Debbie and John were were discussing, you know, the flight, and he had no idea that there was really a need for such a thing, and Debbie said, you have no idea. So that's really how, uh, you know, Pilots and Paws took flight, the idea took flight. We came up with a catchy name, Pilots and Paws. We started to email and message different pilot groups. We had um, a story actually run in AOPA magazine. And that was a big help for attracting pilots to our cause because this was early 2008 when we were really starting up. And to date, we now have more than 5,000 pilots who have rescued oh, more no. than 75 animals. Jeez. Okay, so for people <laughs> listening, wondering, okay, why is this a thing, right? Because there's people who want pets and people who dump pets and people who breed pets in every city. Why is this a thing? The, okay, there's a few reasons that contribute to this factor that's causing this dilemma that you're now solving. Things like legislation. A new law comes through and bans pit bulls or a bunch of attacks in a city happen and a certain breed gets really maligned and many, many people start dumping them or not wanting them or the breeders who've been breeding them no longer have markets for them, this kind of thing. So a dog, a particular dog can be unwanted in one area. It's a pain to own a pit bull in a place like Toronto where everyone's telling you, you can't have that dog here, you know. I mean, some places are really inhospitable to certain breeds. So that's one reason there's a glut. Another reason is the puppy mill phenomena. If you have a movie like a Chihuahua movie coming out in L.A., then you will have a ton of puppy mill, not the best motivated breeders who want to capitalize on the fad dog of that moment. And it's particularly prone to the toys because they're easy to handle in small spaces. So you'll have a ton of chihuahuas produced all at once in one area. You can't like sneeze in LA without hitting a chihuahua. But up here, 
Everybody wants the tiny, tiny dogs. We got too many big dogs in our SPCAs and our shelters up in Canada, and maybe not not quite enough little, well-behaved dogs to supply demand. So this is part of the reason this happens. Okay, so that's an awful lot of pilots and an awful lot of pets saved in how many years, Kate? Oh, we first started in 2008. And we had our sponsor, Subaru and Petmate, joined our cause fairly early on. They joined actually in 2009. And once they partnered with us, you know, the numbers just skyrocketed. We have more than 12,000 uh, non-pilot volunteers who are registered with our website. And like I said, we have over 5,000 pilot volunteers. Our long-term goal that we would like to hit would be 10,000 pilots because as more and more pilots join Pilots and Paws, we see fewer and fewer flight requests go unfilled. And we've always had positive growth in the numbers of animals that we've flown to safety each and every year. Okay, I want to I want to attack two things you just mentioned and just get into it a little deeper. So, non pilots are these people who drive dogs to the airport? Is that is that the deal with that? Who who are the non pilot volunteers that you probably yeah want exactly more of? that is one of the things that non pilot volunteers do would be to provide ground transport. Also, fostering is you know a very important part of animal rescue that people who maybe don't have their pilot's license could help us with because most of our pilots fly about 250 miles each. So to be able to accommodate a larger rescue in terms of distance, we'll actually see maybe four or five pilots really together and they network so that that way they can move an animal a further distance. And in the summer months, this might not be quite an issue, but in the winter months, our pilots are flying, you know, smaller, often single engine planes. They're flying, you know, Cessnas and Pipers and Cirrus. So, you know, it's not the big commercial planes that a lot of us who aren't familiar with general aviation are used to. So they have to be very, very cognizant of inclement weather and the effect that that would have on their planes. So sometimes in the winter months, we'll see, you know, an animal or a few animals that are starting out in a more southern state, like maybe South Carolina. And that pilot could fly them on to Virginia, where another pilot's waiting, and the next pilot could fly from Virginia to New Jersey. And then maybe in New Jersey, there's a big snowstorm. So suddenly, you know, these four right. or five furry passengers are stranded, kind of. They're having a little bit of a makeshift layover. So then if the pilot, quite often pilots will, you know, house the animals if they can, but sometimes they can't. So then they'll go to a volunteer map on our forum board where volunteer fosters are listed and maybe someone locally has volunteered and then that person can watch the animals until the weather clears and they could continue the flight on to the final destination, which could be Maine. And so, yeah. you know, fostering can be something that's really a make or break situation with animal rescue. So fostering is a huge thing. Um, we have people who volunteer to do fundraising. When you talk about mm-hmm. fostering, and I'm going to try and generate some volunteers for you from my listening audience, because this could be anywhere in North America, right? Or anywhere mm-hmm. in America. And um, the the fostering thing, though, I mean, sometimes you think about fostering and you think, what am I bringing into my house? Right. When you're talking about Guatemalan dog rescue and they come across the board and they got every parasite and they got this and they got that. They got all these issues. And okay, it strikes me that those dogs aren't going to be selected for your program because they're not going to travel well. Are the dogs and cats selected for your program easy to handle, easy to take care of? Well, you know, it does vary because so all of for the most part, they are. And, you know, they all have health certificates and different paperwork from the veterinarians before they fly. But you know, sometimes these animals are coming from really horrible situations. So the nice thing is everyone's very upfront with what's going on. You know, when the person who is requesting transport posts the request, you know, they'll describe the temperament and the behavior of the animal. So for the most part, you know, these animals are happy and our pilots always talk about how it's almost like these dogs and cats and different animals know that they're going from a bad place to a better place because they're just so easy to handle. And they just, the general, you know, atmosphere of the airport is they seem very, very happy. But, um, you know, there are times when an animal maybe is coming from an abuse situation. And I have to preface this by saying it's amazing actually how many abused animals we've seen that are just still so incredibly lovable. You know, sometimes you just ponder how they can still be so warm and so giving and so kind after what they've faced. But, you know, there are times when maybe an animal is purposely kept in its crate, you know, if it has some kind of behavioral issues. So, you know, you usually know what you're getting into before you would So, okay, these pilots, they, they just strike me as heroes in all this, honestly. I mean, what kind of a guy or girl who's a pilot 
who's paid a lot of money to fly planes or has to gas up and pay a lot of fees and taxes and landing fees and maintenance fees. What kind of person just goes out of their way for a dog? I mean, yeah, that, we have a great can we start a dating site? Because these guys sound like the best guys around. Yeah, we have a great group, you know, for most of them, it's a labor of love. It's kind of funny because we've actually had one pilot who emailed us and said that his wife is finally letting him buy a plane because she's the huge animal lover. He's the guy who was really into aviation. And the, you know, the terms of the agreement of buying a new plane for them was we have to fly rescue missions for Pilots and Paws every weekend. So it's nice because it's a win-win for both of them, you know. He loves being Oh, I hope she's right into this. I hope, I hope she takes full advantage of this. I hope she goes out and buy some kind of Halloween costume, you know, super pet rescue lady, get her groove on there, really show off, because this is like living your alter ego. She gets to go like in her spare time and fly off and rescue pets. That's super cool. Nice one. Way to give back and have a good time and still make the husband happy. That's a a very compromising marriage. It it sounds really good. Okay, so you got these people, pilots, Let's target mm-hmm. the pilots who might be listening or people who know pilots. If you know a pilot with a, a love of dogs, maybe a love of cats, what kind of a situation does he need to be in to, uh, well, we're going to come after the break and talk about that because I'm quite interested in these people. What kind of a person does this? What kind of a plane do they have? Where are they flying from and to? What is involved? Is it hours extra of their time? Is it money? I don't know. I just want to know more about this. So stay tuned. We'll be back talking with Kate Quinn. And she's from Pilots and Paws. That's Pilots with an N after Paws. Pilots and Paws. Pilots and Paws. And uh, we'll be talking to her more about these pilots on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere because the best is yet to come. Stick around. Do you know that moment when your dirty dog's about to jump in your nice, clean car? You can avoid all the cleanup and mess with a 4K9 seat cover. 4K9 makes heavy-duty seat covers and cargo liners that will blend seamlessly with the interior of your vehicle. You can find us at 4K9s.com, that's the number 4, K-N-I-N-E-S.com, or on Amazon.com. 4K9 makes nothing but the best for your best friend. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Amazing Pet Expos is coming to a city near you. Admission is always free, and your pet is welcome. Shopping, adoptions, free nail trims, discounted shots and microchipping, agility, a pet costume contest, and much more. Plus, meet the guys from Animal Planet's hit TV series Tank and Pit Boss online at AmazingPetExpos.com. Bring your pets to the Pet Expo. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> You're, you're, you're inside the VIP room. With the hottest party in town. Back to the party. Let's go! Hello! You're listening to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio, and we are having a party with a bunch of pilots. I can only imagine what that would be like. I'm here at Camp Good Dog as usual, and if you want to see the daily campers, which include a three legged dog who I understand has quite a following when we post pictures of him on our Facebook site playing with the other dogs. So he's here right now. And uh, all the boarding dogs, we take pictures of them. We put them on our Camp Good Dog Facebook site. But you can access that and some of my favorite shows, like some of the shows I've done here and and some of my favorite things, just by going to DebraWolfOnline.com. Right now I'm revamping it and I'm about to launch a whole bunch of things like courses, Offered by my favorite people and books I've written made into ebooks and my DVD made into a download, all coming up, plus links to everything, everything that I'm doing, my whole animal world. So if you want to just see it all with one click, that'll be coming soon. I'll be teasing you all on an upcoming show 
when I have a giveaway to try and get you to go there and check it out and give me your feedback. As always, if you want something covered on this show, let me know. Email me and we will cover it. If you've got a guest idea or a question or a query, why does my cat turn around and and scratch the floor after he eats, for example. Why does my dog turn around, turn around, turn around, then go to sleep? Why does my dog hate my cat? Why does my cat hate my husband? All these types of things. How can I fix it? How can I make my cat like my new husband? How can I make my cat use the litter box? Number one question. And I guess for dogs, number one question would be, well, two, it's a tie. It's how can I get him to heal? Three way. How can I get him to come when called and there's something better to do? And how can I get him to stay off people? So those are probably the three most popular with the dog world. All right. So we've been talking about pilots and paws with Kate Quinn. And um, Kate, do you want to give out your website right now while, while we're thinking of it? Great. It's www.pilotsandpaws.org. And spelling that out, it is www. Dot P-I-L-O-T-S-N-P-A-W-S dot O-R-G. Nice. Okay. So I heard about you just randomly years ago. I think it was Arden Moore was hired to fly on a plane and we were talking about it. There was some kind of new new um, airline launch for just pets. I can't, I can't remember the details of it, but I was interviewing her and, uh, and she mentioned this. She said, you know, if you ever need, because I said, it's too bad that wouldn't work for a rescue. It's so expensive. And she said, well, off air, she told me, you know, there's this other organization and it just stuck in my brain, stuck in my brain all the this time until last week I've been taking care of this golden retriever that needs a home lovely dog loves people like loves people big big heart over her the big cartoon heart over her head loves children loves needy people I was training her for a special needs boy and circumstances have changed and he's not able to take possession of her so she's super attentive and loving to people who need her and a very well-behaved medium-sized golden retriever five years old but all of a sudden she has no home and I sunk a whole lot of time in order to train her for this special boy. And now, you know, that seems to be moved and there's other reasons. So it looks like I have to find a home for her. In the meantime, someone saw that on my website. Someone Now, I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, so right above Seattle. And someone way down in Nashville, Tennessee, regular listener to the show, sometime caller, regular. He, he goes on our Camp Good Dog Facebook site and likes some of the dogs sometimes, usually golden retrievers swimming. But um, his dog just died, golden retriever. And, uh, you know, he had to put it to sleep. It was very sick with cancer for years. And he's just heartbroken. And then he sees Sparkle, my golden. So he texted and emailed and, or emailed rather, and tried to see if I could get Sparkle from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada to Nashville, Tennessee. And I don't think I can. I'm sad to say, but maybe someday if you get more pilots, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, the more pilots we have, the more relays that can happen because what you need to have with a relay flight is you need to have multiple pilots who are available fairly at the same time, you know, in the same area to all volunteer. So yeah, as Pilots and Paws has expanded throughout the years, we've seen more and more relays and longer flights. And also, if we attract more pilots or more people who um, use jets to travel jets, And jet plane owners and pilots can actually transport animals, you know, coast to coast fairly easily. So while we've only had a handful of flights that have taken place from, you know, east coast to west coast or vice versa, you know, those jet owners and pilots can actually accommodate those kind of requests. So if anyone out there knows someone with a jet, please, you know, tell them to visit our website. Now, what about Canada? Like, for me, it wouldn't be a problem at all to drive this dog to Bellingham. It's probably a 40-minute drive from my house. No big deal. Can it work that way for Canadians who live along the border to access this, whether they're offering homes for pets or looking to have pets find their homes? Could it go up to, like, maybe, I don't know, Rochester maybe? And I'm just trying to think uh, where. We have had some flights over the U.S.-Canadian border where... You know, the southern, very southern part of Canada or northern pilots in the U.S., what we do is we'll have the person in Canada list the um, closest zip code that's in the United States as, you know, a point of where the dog would be flown to or from. And also, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we have Pilots and Paws Canada, 
which is a sister program to ours. It's, it's run and governed separately, but we, we uh, licensed out to them in, in actually June of 2012. And it's just a wonderful organization. So they're actually making flights within Canada. But we have seen a handful of flights, you know, worked out between Canadians and Americans. The border in some places around here anyway, between Vancouver, British Columbia area, the suburbs of Surrey and White Rock in particular, and Langley. I was once walking in Langley with a bunch of dogs doing a dog walk, and I actually crossed the border. I actually had a guard come up to me. He comes through the bush and everything. He's like, excuse me, you're not allowed to be here. I had no idea. I'd call, I just left my country into yours. So it's that insignificant when we're talking about distance and also pets. Does your dog care mm -hmm. if he grows up in a Canadian family? Does a dog, a homeless dog, care if he grows up in an American family? Not really. Is he getting fed? Is he seeing the vet? Is he getting walked? Is he getting loved? That's about what he cares about. He doesn't care what part of the continent you're in. So I'm really glad you're opening it up a little bit. Is there any hope for this guy who wants the golden retriever at my place and he's in Nashville or not yet? Do you know how many miles is between your place and Nashville? I, thousands. It's probably the same as flying Seattle, New York. It's probably roughly the same. Oh, then it's like cross -cut. not. Yeah, most of the flights for pilots and paws are about 900 miles or less because even with 900 miles, you're probably having three or four pilots relayed together. So we've seen that's kind of, you know, where the chance of us being able to help out kind of tapers off is around a thousand mile mark. You know, we have had some rare occasions where there have been flights from, you know, Florida to Pennsylvania, which is a little bit over a thousand miles, but it would definitely be less likely. Florida to Pennsylvania, that's the snowbird running in reverse. Okay, snowbirds, if you're flying your own planes and you're going from Canada to Florida or Canada to Arizona, I know you're out there. I know you are, you Palm Springs crowd. Why don't you take a puppy along? So for these jet pilots and pilots that you're looking for, what does it involve? Is there a lot of extra time and effort? How, how complicated is this for them on the day of flight, say? You mentioned the snowbirds, actually. That made me think of the premise of Pilots and Paws is if you're already flying somewhere for business or pleasure and you're a pilot, why not check the forum board and see if there are some animals that need to go the same direction as you? So we actually do have a lot of couples who do fly back and forth, you know, from the northern states of Florida, and quite often they do bring animals with them when they do this. And I know before the break, you were interested in, you know, what a Pilots and Paws pilot looks like. And, yes, you know, exactly. obviously having more than 5,000, you know, there's variations, but I think the biggest commonality is the fact that they're, you know, lovers of both aviation and animals, but they can actually vary dramatically based on age. You know, we have some PMP pilots who are only 13 years old and we have some PMP pilots who are actually older than 80. We had one, I think it was in 2013, uh, PMP pilot Elliot, who on his, what he wanted for his 80th birthday was to fly a PMP mission and been a very active pilot before turning 80. So he knew a lot of rescue groups that he often worked with. So they purposely made sure that on his exact birthday, he had a flight waiting for him. It was really special because they, they made a cake, actually. They ordered a cake that had our Pilots and Paws logo. So, you know, it was a wonderful celebration. I think one of his really, really memorable birthdays. So, Wait a minute, you know, though. On the other end, you said a th did you say a 13-year-old, like a kid pilot? Yeah, so one oh, thing that's man, great no, and that's, anyone who's that been guy on the fence. A costume. That little boy, that, that young man, that young woman, that 13-year-old needs a costume. That is the superhero <laughs> All the way. That should be your like poster child there, the emblem. The two of them standing. Yeah, it's them. great to see. I mean, people love seeing stories from some of our younger pilots that we do post on Facebook and our website. And if anyone out there is on the fence about possibly earning their pilot's license, because we actually have had people contact us and say, you know, I didn't know if I would do it, but hearing about your organization pushed me over the edge and now I'm going to take pilot lessons and flight training lessons. If you fly pilots and pause missions with your flight instructor, you're essentially making your flight training tax deductible. So for because we are a 501c3 national nonprofit, our pilots can deduct portions of their flights, such as fuel or if they you know, rent a plane, different costs as taxable donations. So it's really nice because if you're out there earning your pilot license, you have to build a lot of hours to get that certificate and you're making your oh flight my training gosh, this is, this and is adding so meaning to all the hours you have to 
fulfilled. That is so much easier a ride than the usual way for people who can't afford to get their pilot license but are desperate to, which is joining the army yeah. and serving 10 years. <laughs> Seriously, this is way easier route to go. Holy, you can become a pilot, do the right thing as you're learning, offset your costs, and probably end up uh, networking as a side effect with a lot of pilots. You might land yourself a job at the end as a result. And, you know, we've had pilots, younger pilots, and even older pilots who are just, you know, regaining currency. They've talked about how helpful it was with, you know, different issues such as weights and balance. They're getting real-life experience as they're loading the crates in with their flight instructor observing them, you know, about how the weight could be distributed in the plane. So they're actually almost getting, you know, a richer experience of learning the flight training if they're flying these P&P missions because it's just bringing some real-life scenarios at the forefront of their flight training. So once a pilot volunteers, what if it's a work flight and he really can't, you know, muck about right before and after and, and sort of, is there staff, volunteers helping him get the dog to the plane through whatever checks of vaccines and other things need to be done? Is there someone else bringing a kennel so he doesn't have to purchase or rent one? You know what I mean? Like, is it is it assisted? So all he really does is, you know, say hello and load and fly? I know exactly what you mean. We have, whenever pilots join Pilots and Paws and even pilots who just need additional crates who have been flying with us for years, we send out starter kits to new pilots. They just have to send us an email and we send out crates that will fit in their planes. We give them a list of, you know, all of the sizes that we have. We'll send out harnesses and tethers for in case they'd like to tether a larger animal that might not fit in the crate, you know, to perhaps their back seat. We send out collars and leashes and water bowls, T-shirts for them, piles and piles T-shirts, really any supplies that they could use during their flights. So most of our pilots, and then they, they keep those items, actually, and they reuse them, you know, flight after flight after flight. So most of our pilots already have the supplies that they need. And then the way it works is there are just so many wonderful volunteers out in rescue. And these are the people who are, you know, posting the transfer request to our forum board. And they're, so you have usually like sending and receiving parties with animal rescue. So the senders take the animals from, you know, the kill shelter. They drive them to the airport that's been determined where the pilot will take off. And, you know, they're just very, very helpful to the pilots. You know, it's really a team effort. They get the dogs loaded. And then on the other end, once the pilot lands, then there will be the receiving party has, you know, volunteers that come to that area. Or sometimes it's even the person who is actually adopting the animal, which I think is always really special because as a pilot, it's really an incredible experience to, you know, hand a puppy that you've just flown out of a kill shelter that maybe wouldn't be alive if you didn't get out that day versus the next and you're handing it to, you know, putting it in the arms of a child that this is their newest member of their family. So it's really, really heartwarming when the people who are actually adopting the animals are at the airport. But, you know, equally so when just the rescue volunteers are there because it's a team effort and everyone is just, you know, willing to go above and beyond to make everything run as smoothly as possible. Thank you, Kate. Uh, it's Kate Quinn from pilotsandpaws.org. Thank you very much for joining us today on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. We've just about run out of time. It's been so nice having you. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for everything you do for rescue animals. We really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. I, so, I hope someday I'll be able to tell people, oh, anywhere you are, if you want a rescue dog, there's this great organization that'll just get him from where he is to where you are. I hope. I hope I'll be funneling rescue homes your way soon. So everybody, if you know a pilot, if you know a kid who's training to be a pilot or any person who wants to train to be a pilot and they would like to take advantage of this tax deductible thing and they have a love of animals, well, well, now's your chance. Tell them all about it. Pilotsandpaws.org or Pilots and Paws Canada. Thank you very much, Kate. Everybody, from me, Deb Wolf, DebraWolfOnline.com. Out here at Camp Good Dog, where the dogs play and swim and make the most of every day. Until next week, until next time, from Animal Party Pet Life Radio, be good dear animals. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.